Well, welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam. I'm your host tonight, Bill Dixon, here at the International Headquarters of Amnon Nissan Communications. I uh, hope you enjoyed the show tonight. It's uh, uh, when did the Vietnam War start and when did it end? And when I'm either going to get you totally confused uh, because there's about six different dates uh, that the government has decided that uh, uh, the war began and so forth. But we'll get started on that. Uh, those of you who tuned in on the last show we did, uh, it was a kind of a follow-up on a show we've done several times uh, about Joseph Hargrove and the other two young Marines who were left on the island of Kotang uh, as a result of the Mayaquez incident. Uh, the young man who wrote the article, uh, well, he is, uh, he's had some interesting phone calls and, and emails from uh, some of that group. And uh, guys, if you were out there by chance listening tonight, uh, Hey, we, nobody said anything about y'all uh, having been involved that the three guys got left. Uh, you were doing your job. You went back to the ship. Uh, if there's anything that was said on the show, uh, I, I would in, uh, really love to have you on the show. Or we can do it by Skype, and you can give your part of the whole thing. But uh, the main thing is to get those remains of those three young men brought home and get some closure for those families and uh, get the three names that were... Uh, well, called deserters and a little bit of everything else, get their name uh, back out there to uh, where it should be. But if you've got uh, something that you want to say about the uh, that incident, uh, we'd love to have you to come on the show and uh, and correct whatever it was, because uh, that's my whole idea of being on the show, was to uh, overcome some of myths and confusion about the Vietnam War. It's the most misunderstood, misreported uh, war has ever been in, in the history of the world, I believe. Uh, tonight, as you can see, uh, we want you to call in and be part of the show. Uh, all you got to do is dial 919-518-9773 and uh, make comments, ask questions, or whatever you'd like to do to participate in the show. An even better way is to go on to Skype, as you see it there on your screen, and that address is computers. 2K Voice to tune in and, uh, and be part of the show. If you log in on the website, uh, put your name down so we know who you are and so forth. And if you need to contact me for ideas on the show or uh, anything else you want to do, uh, my email is lessonsofvietnam at ncbi.org. So that's uh, to get us started on the show. It's some of the housekeeping and so forth we want to do. And... Uh, so uh, that's uh, a couple of things coming up. Also, March uh, 16th, we'll be doing a symposium with the North Carolina History Museum. Uh, that will be a symposium, and the subject matter is Vietnam, Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, and Afghanistan, similarities and differences. Uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, panelist, a group of panelists on there to talk about uh, differences and likes. Uh, from what I've been told by some of the Gulf War One, uh, there was there was a lot of similarity between that and Vietnam, but it didn't change just quite a bit after that. So, also on March 23rd, 24th, 25th, we will be doing the Vietnam Experience at the North Carolina History Museum. We will have some of these shows running on uh, a loop, so you can go, come, sit down and, and watch some of these shows that you've missed. Uh, also, uh, the drama Etchings in Stone will be uh, shown regularly with one-eighth version of the uh, uh, Vietnam Memorial Wall with the, uh, with the aspects of having a computer there and a printer so we can look up a name on the wall and give you a printout about the person. We'll have some dioramas, uh, some displays, weapons, vehicles, some helicopters, a little bit about everything to do with uh, a Vietnam experience. Uh, along with some real Vietnam veterans and so forth. So uh, put those down on your calendar and get on with the show now. Uh, when did the Vietnam War uh, begin and end? And next slide. You know, this question is discussed all the time, but one of the best, what I really wanted to do the show was uh, in Vietnam, uh, uh, the Veteran Magazine by Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, this gentleman, Mark Lipson, had a great article on when the war started and all the confusion and so forth. So uh, this is where the part of the show came in. I've just kind of expanded on a little bit. Uh, as I said before, some of the answers that I'm going to give you probably confuse you. 
about as much as, as, as enlightening you, but uh, it somewhat depends on what government entity you end up asking what went on. Uh, now, my notes here says there's four official dates for the uh, beginning of the Vietnam War, and uh, I believe there's at least six, so we'll see. Now, the first date of the, uh, the Vietnam War was January 1st, 1960, to April 30th, 1975. Now, for those who were of us who were in Vietnam to receive this medal, you had to be in Vietnam during uh, January 1st, 1960 to April 30th, 1975. Then you're authorized to wear this medal. Now, where that date came from, I don't know because nothing significant in Vietnam happened that day. Uh, just somebody kind of picked that date. I just, uh, who, who, who did that one? The next date we're going to talk about was February 28, 1961 to May 7, 1975. Now, the government got together and said, we need to get together and Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Assistant Act of 1974. So in 1974, they decided to, uh, there were Vietnam vets out there that needed help. So they met, passed a law, Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act. And you know, on a previous show, I had asked, uh, when there were the word Vietnam era veterans came from, and I guess lo and behold, it came from the government, uh, which is strange in itself. Then on January 9th, 1962 to May of 1975, those are the dates that they give uh, benefits to people who were exposed to Agent Orange. Now, where they come up with those dates, I'm not quite certain either, but that's the date that uh, if you have or expose, if you have a disease that's on the category Agent Orange, uh, you can put in a claim for it uh, between January 9th and 1962. If you were January 8th and you left there on January 8th, you can't put in a claim according to this. So uh, anyway, it's the government. August 5th, 1964 to May 7th, 1965. The Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Act that defines Vietnam Era Veterans. So anybody who was in Vietnam, sir, excuse me, let me go back up. Anybody who was in the military between August 5th, 1964 to May 1965, May 7th, would be considered, I think that should have been 75. I think I got a typo there. Uh, I do that from time to time. Um, those are the dates that you are either a Vietnam vet or a Vietnam era vet. I apologize for the uh, mistype there. Sometimes my brain and computer do, won't work together well. Uh, this, is a supposed, this was the day that the supposedly Gulf of Tonkin incident that started the war. This was supposed to be August 5th, 1964 when it got started. So. Then we have November 1st, 1955 to May 15th, 1975. This is the date that the Pentagon came up with on, to start their commemorative of the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. Uh, this is the date that the MACV, or the Military Assistance Command Group, uh, started operations in Vietnam. That's where the Special Forces and so forth, uh, officially, uh, they were there earlier. Now, June 8, 1956, this is the date on the first panel of the Vietnam Memorial Wall. So if you look at the wall, it starts in 1956 and ends in 1975, and the first name on the wall is United States Air Force Tech Sergeant, Sergeant Richard Fitzgibbons, Jr., and he was actually killed by another airman. I don't know exactly what assistance was on that, but he was killed. He was the first one on the wall in, in the Vietnam Memorial Wall. So that's another date. Now, part of the confusion out there is uh, you know, the myths and different stories and misinformation is, this, is, is things like this. If you look at the bottom right there in small print, it says, First U.S. Serviceman in Vietnam to be killed in action, December 22, 1964. Now, this young man uh, was part of the, uh, one of the earlier groups that went over to Vietnam. The, um, and I'm going to read you what the information I got from him here. Uh, June 1st, 1936, when he was born, he died, was killed December 22nd, 1961. One of the first Americans to be killed in action in Vietnam. Specialist Ford Davis was a direction finder DF operator on 13th May, 1961, the first contingent of Army Security Agency, 
personnel arrived in South Vietnam. They set up a, a base in Tan San uh, Air Base, which is right there at Saigon. In fact, right today it's in the middle of Saigon. Uh, it's part of the uh, MACB group and uh, radio research unit. And uh, a friend of mine was, uh, when he was a recruiter, was talking to him and suggested radio research group. He said, oh, they'll never be sent to Vietnam. Uh, so much for that, huh? Um, now, his mission when, when he first got there was to find the enemy radios and so forth. And he was killed on a road right outside of Saigon by an ambush, December 1961. Now, according to his website here, it says, May Davis, the first American soldier to lose his life during the Vietnam War. Now, where did that information come from? Well, it could come from this. Davis was not actually the first American to lose his life in combat in Vietnam, but apparently President Lyndon Johnson, in a speech made late, years later, referred to Spec 4 James T. Davis as the first American, and now several websites refer to Davis this way. Either event, he was, he was KIA, he was one of our guys that got killed in Vietnam, and he was killed early on. And as I mentioned before, uh, they named the, uh, the place that uh, he worked there at Saigon at Tonsonuk was the Davis Station. I had always heard of the Davis Station and so forth. So, officially, unofficially, let's go this route. Unofficially, the United States uniformed military personnel were all boots on the ground in September of 1945. This was the end of World War II and the Japanese occupation of Vietnam. Vietnam then was called the Indochina War. See, uh, the French had left. The Japanese came in and took over and, and run the French out. We, in turn, went in and gave Ho Chi Minh and General Dip uh, weapons and training to run the Japanese out. But when World War II was over, for some reason, the powers that be decided to give Vietnam back to uh, the French even though Ho Chi Minh wanted it to be all Vietnam, Vietnamese run, which has created the problem we had before. Uh, you had Vietnamese nationalists who wanted Vietnam as one country. So after, after, the, French, after the French came back in, uh, they were fighting the communist, uh, the Viet Minh, who were the uh, communists there in, in Vietnam. They were actually fighting in what we normally think of now as North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Uh, because the famous battle of Dinh Binh Phu was right outside of Hanoi. But uh, during that period of time, we were furnishing all the money. We were, pay we were paying the bills for the French. We were sending in American soldiers as advisors. We were buying supplies, food. Basically, we were paying the bills for uh, the French to uh, stay there and fight uh, during the occupation. And it just... You know, we, we, we had people going over there and, and getting killed and getting wounded, uh, but they weren't part of the Vietnam War because back then it was still uh, French Indochina. Now, the next picture gives you an idea of Dinh Binh Phu. It was not a, well, there was a city there, but it was actually a large military base that the French set up. And what it was there for, if you notice it the, on, uh, on the map there, it's right on the uh, Laotian border with Vietnam. The idea was to stop the supplies coming in from uh, China and Laos was the, with the base there. Um, in September 26, 1945, the first American military personnel to be killed in Vietnam was Lieutenant Colonel Peter Dewey, who was also ambushed by the communist Viet Minh in Saigon. Unfortunately, Dewey and other Americans were killed in, in Vietnam before June 8, 1965 and not listed on the Vietnam Memorial Wall, or can they officially wear the Vietnam service ribbon? Because they didn't exist officially, unofficially. So even though we lost people in Vietnam prior to that date, um, they, they were not officially there. It's, so when did the Vietnam War begin? Well, I tell you, for me, it began in June of 1967. But when was the real beginning? Let's, I'm going to let you decide. January 1st, 1960, the Vietnam Service Medal date. Okay, that's when you, you qualified to get the, wear the medal. February 28, 1961, the Vietnam Era Veterans Adjustment Act of 1974 picked that date. Now, what hat they picked that out of, I'm not quite certain. 
And then the January 9th, 1962, the Department of Veterans Affairs day for Agent Orange. That was the day, Agent Orange, that was also the day. Then August 5th, 1964, the Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Act of 1974, which means that anybody who was in the military uh, were co considered Vietnam Era veterans or Vietnam veterans. That's where the very Vietnam Era veterans. Uh, I'm not quite certain why there was a difference other than uh, there was probably some benefits supposed to go to the combat veterans that the non-combat veterans uh, didn't get. I'm not certain what they are because I think all of them are pretty much the same now. And then November 1st, 1955 uh, is the date that the Pentagon's 50th anniversary to commemoration of the uh, war in Vietnam. Um, that is, let's see, one, two, three, four. That's five dates right there. But let's talk about another date. Was the beginning date June 8th, 1964? When the date of use, that was the date of the first name on the Vietnam Memorial Wall, U.S. Air Force Technical Sergeant Richard Fitzgibbons Jr., which is another first date of the Vietnam War started. You know, it's no wonder there's so much confusion out there about the Vietnam War and misstatements and mistruths, and uh, when even the government who put the war on, they sponsored the war. I can't come up with an actual date. It's crazy. So I guess it's kind of like, you pick the date you like. Um, I picked June, uh, June 1967, because that was my date. Uh, I don't know. I, it's, it, it's crazy. to. I can't imagine having a war and nobody knows for certain when it started. Was that also June 8th? Huh? 67? Oh, uh, mine was, I, I don't mind what date it was when I got there. It's probably I've, somewhere around I see, June 8th. I see June 8th, 56. Yeah. I, saw June I got 8th. there probably June, around June 8th, no, 1967. Here, in, yeah. Among your dates. Yeah. There's June 8th, 57. Yeah. There's June 8th, 64. Yeah. Well, there's, something is wrong. This is my birthday, June 8th. June 8th uh, is your uh, birthday. What, what, what is going on here? Uh, Did I you do know. that on purpose? Uh, no, that's the okay. date. Unless the government may have said, uh, Emma <laughs> Nissan's coming in. We need to make this on his birthday so he can make sure he remembers it and so forth. It's uh, moving right along. Okay. Let's talk about... We now that I've got you totally confused about when it began. Like I said, just pick a date you like. And then your friend may pick a different date, and y'all can argue back and forth on who's, which one is right, because it could be any one of the six or seven dates. And it may be even some other dates that you want to pick. I mean, I don't know. Now, when did the Vietnam War end? That also has some confusions. Not much is, is when it began, but did the Vietnam War end in March 29, 1973, when the last official combat troops left South Vietnam? It ended for the combat troops, but see, there were people left behind, advisors who were left behind, who were advising the South Vietnamese. There were military personnel who were at the big cities like Saigon, uh, Hue, and Da Nang. There were military personnel there. Uh, so, would that be the end of the war? So that was the date we officially left officially left Vietnam as combat soldiers, or was it April 30th when the last Marines got on that helicopter and left Saigon? By the way, that picture for all these years, who said the last helicopter leaving from the Roof of the embassy. See, that was wrong. It did not leave from the embassy. That building is still there, by the way, but the embassy is gone. It was a CIA annex inside the compound, but it was not the American embassy itself. When you see those guys climbing up that ladder to get on that last helicopter, they are not leaving the embassy. But that was the time that the embassy was closed down and... That's another story about why the embassy was left uh, open for so long that we had to uh, rush out of there, almost leaving people behind. We did leave uh, a lot of good uh, South Vietnamese people behind and moving out. Or was the last day of the Vietnam War, May 17, 1975, when the Mayaquez incident, where the Cambodian uh, communists captured a, a U.S. ship called the Mayaquez. 
Now, Minkalubic book about we just finished our last show we were talking about the Maya Quest. You, the SS Maya Quest uh, was the ship that was captured by the Cambodians and President Gerald Ford sent in the United States Marines to rescue the 31 to 35 sailor hostages. I've seen it listed both ways. So, uh, as everything else in the Vietnam War, just pick one you like. 31, 35, 32, just pick someone you like. Uh, hostages in there. And there were 40 Marines killed or, le or missing in action, saving those 31. Unfortunately, in reality, as soon as the first bullet was fired, the 31 sailors, or 35 sailors, whichever way it be, were released by the communists and sent out on a Philippine ship out to the uh, American ships. So it's kind of wonder just why the battle was going on. But if you look at the Vietnam Memorial Wall, those men are listed on the Vietnam Wall as 1975. So even though they were not technically in Vietnam, they were in Southeast Asia. So as the wall uh, for not just for people in Vietnam, but it's for people who were killed in Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, or Southeast Asia. Um, it's also kind of confusing. Now, if you'll notice in the picture here, the arrow right there uh, happens to be pointed at Joseph Hargrove and uh, uh, Danny Marshall and Gary, uh, Gary Hall. Those were the three Marines left behind. But as you see that whole area right there with the 40-some that uh, were killed, uh, and after the fall of Saigon. So, is that the official date that it closed? Or the one that Saigon failed the end of the war? Which one would you pick as the end? Now, the ending, breaks, the, the ending dates bring up several stories here. Was it the last soldier, uh, combat soldier left Vietnam on March 29th, as I said before? And then people go back and say, we lost the war. How could the American combat soldier lost the war? They weren't there. They'd already gone home. So who lost the war? That's, you know, that start, when you start talking about what day it ended, who lost the war? Well, did the South Vietnamese combat soldier lose the war? I mean, uh, some people talk bad about them, but they fought very well. Uh, right on up until the end, uh, April 30th, 1975, when Saigon fell. Uh, but there were some of the South Vietnamese soldiers who continued fighting until they ran out of ammunition and food and supplies and so forth, and they went from uh, machine guns to 10 years in slave labor camps. So would that be the official end of the uh, war, or would it be 30 days when the last guys uh, uh, surrendered? I don't know. Uh, I personally think this is the date uh, of the uh, end of the Vietnam War. Did Congress lose the war in Vietnam? Two years after the United States quit the war in Vietnam, Gerald Ford went to Congress and said, okay, in the Paris Peace Accords, Henry Kissinger promised South Vietnam in order to get them to agree reluctantly to the um, Paris of Peace Accords, which, by the way, made no sense whatsoever anyway, because the Paris Peace Accords allowed North Vietnam to leave their soldiers in South Vietnam. It's like, oh, they won't want to go any further. They're just going to stay where they are and, and get a suntan or whatever. I, you know, uh, but they, they signed the accord, uh, and we were supposed to help the South Vietnamese people. But Congress said... Not only no, but hell no. They actually doing a speech that Gerald Ford gave to Congress going, we promised these people our money. We have a treaty, a lawful treaty. They actually got up and left during the middle of his speech. You think politics today is crazy. It won't much difference back when Gerald Ford was there because uh, they got up and left and wouldn't give any money. So... With the day they got up and left, was that the end of the Vietnam War? Because it was pretty much over for South Vietnam. When they, because the, uh, the Russians and the uh, Ch China was all giving uh, money and supplies to North Vietnam, and South Vietnam was a country with no allies at the time. We couldn't even fly close to Vietnam 
uh, where they, uh, the way Congress changed and so forth. So would that be the day that the Vietnam War ended? I think it is. Now, people hadn't quit dying until much later, but that was the end of the war, just where people were dying for no reason whatsoever up until that time. On April 23rd, this one really gets to me, April 23rd at a speech in Tulane University, Gerald Ford was talking about the Vietnam War and how we got out and so forth. And you can remember, I just got there telling you about how Congress reneged on their, on their uh, uh, treaty. Gerald Ford actually got up in front of Tulane University students, and, and I'm going to give this quote here. Today, Americans can regain the sense of pride that existed before Vietnam. But it cannot be achieved by refighting a war. What is it that can't be achieved? The pride? The victory? You got to remember, we walked off and left the South Vietnamese people. Whether we should have been there or not is not the question here. The question is, we walked off and left those people after we promised them with a treaty, our allies, that we would send them supplies and we reneged on our treaty with them. Why should anybody ever trust our Congress again with this sort of stuff? But a sense of pride? How can you have a sense of pride when you threw a whole country under the bus? Now see, the thing about it was, when this speech was made, as it says here in the notes, South Vietnam was devastated because the war was still going on. Now, the, good, the, the communist uh, Russians and Chinese and North Vietnam were going, yay team, uh, the government, uh, uh, Congress is not going to give me any more money uh, right up until the final thing. It's just, but even though uh, Ford uh, did in Congress, I, I won't say Ford did, uh, Congress did. Ford tried his best, but uh, uh, the way Ford came in was kind of, uh, Pseudo president, anyway. You know, as Nixon resigned, how he kind of just stepped in, stepped in his place there, and uh, I don't think he ever saw himself as, as president there. But he came in and had an obligation he felt to all the uh, rest uh, to the people who were leaving uh, South Vietnam. You remember seeing on the news that helicopters were coming out. There were so many helicopters coming out. They were pushing them over the side of the boat. You hear about all the boat people, all the refugees who knew when the communists took over, they were dead because they helped the, North, they helped the United States fight in the South Vietnamese War. So they knew they were going to die, plus when the Congress took over. So he just said, okay, we need to help those people. Uh, kind of to parallels a little bit of what's going on today. With We're going to help all these refugees, and Congress is going, well, we're going to bring them in, but we're not going to vet them, and we're just going to let them come in. Well, Congress said that $507 million you have, forget it. You ain't getting it. So those refugees didn't get any help like the refugees we're getting today. We give them a house, food, give them a salary, give them a job, give them everything else. Here these people who are our allies fighting with us said, no, we're not going to help them at all. Uh, well, I guess we didn't learn some things and... and but things definitely changed. Now, let me throw in a footnote here. One of the things that Ford did that really ticked a lot of people off, after he became president, a month after, he decided that to heal the nation, to bring that pride he was talking about back, he said, all oh, you coward horses rears who left the country, who burned your... Uh, uh, draft cards, but left the country. We're going to forgive you and let you come right back to the United States and take over where you left before. Now, how all these men and women who served in Vietnam, who put their life on the line and stopped their life. See, these guys continued going off to college and, and, and getting their education. The men who fought in Vietnam had to come back from Vietnam and then go to college. So it put them farther behind in the economic status but Gerald Ford said, oh, we're going to welcome you back. We know that you didn't mean it when you renounced this country and left it. So to make it, we're going to just, you can come back and we'll forgive you. I didn't forgive him. Uh, you know. Uh, and then add, add a little bit of uh, salt in the wound. He turned back around and again to heal the nation. 
he uh, for, he uh, forgave uh, Richard Nixon for his impeachment and the Watergate things. And so he said, that's okay. Uh, we're not gonna, we're just going to forget that and roll that under the carpet too because we want to make sure we get on with our life, uh, which was an outrage. By the way, uh, the number that you need to call in and make comments or give me some help and so forth uh, is 919-518-9773. And out there... And you want to add something to this, just uh, go out there and do that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, again, the dates. The last American combat KIA in Vietnam. As an officer, this man served in Korea and in Vietnam. He was an advisor to the South Vietnamese. His name was Colonel William B. No. He was killed by shell fire at Anlock which was later to be another big battle as Saigon, before Saigon fell, uh, 11 hours before the ceasefire came about. See, the North Vietnamese communists attacked, mortared, shotguns, or whatever you want to call them, uh, artillery rounds, almost all military bases just before the end of the cease, just before the beginning of the ceasefire. There was no lull before the ceasefire. Uh, they attacked uh, almost all the major bases and so forth in cities uh, just before the ceasefire. They're kind of getting you the idea of going, uh, well, we got this, we, we, we're going to show you how this uh, peace with, uh, with honor works. And this is his uh, cemetery plot uh, there. Uh, William B. Noel, he was from Michigan, Colonel, United States Army, Korea, Vietnam, August 8, 1929 to January 27, 1973, um, and then some of his medals and so forth. He was the last official combat casualty of the Vietnam War. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that nobody died after he died? No. There were the other Americans who lost their lives after he did in Vietnam. Now, does, were they wounded? I'm not certain how that came about here. Uh, I guess some of the powers that be are going to have to explain it to me. Sometimes people get wounded and may live for three or four days, a week, a month, and then die. So he was the last official one to kill, so if they were wounded and died later, uh, well, it's kind of confusing, isn't it? Let's talk a little bit more about Colonel No, and we're going to go back to that. Remember, we're going to come back to that. This is Colonel Wimmy No. This is what it looked like. He was uh, Advanced Team uh, 40, uh, Advisor Team 47, 3rd Regimental Assistance Command. Uh, casual, started his tour in uh, 6 9 uh, 72. He's uh, killed uh, 1 27, 1973. Now, what I was mentioning a while ago is I want you to look at this. Uh, this is a printout of the Vietnam Wall. If you notice the red line, that is his name, William B. No. Now we come back to the, the guys who were involved in the Mayaquez incident, which is the yellow line. Now, Colonel William B. No was the last official combat soldier, but then you see the guys who were killed uh, in Mayaquez. Where did all those names come in, in between? I know that people got sick over there. They got sometimes uh, some got drunk and fell in a river and got drowned. Lots of ways they could have died. But where did those where did those young men? Uh, I don't think there's a woman on there. It could be because Operation Baby Lift. Uh, we did lose uh, some nurses uh, right at the end. Right at the, at the end. But where do those names? Uh, there are on the wall. They they're not official. I mean, if he was the official, it's, it's, so again, we're going to ask you, when did the Vietnam War end? For a lot of the men and women who served in Vietnam in country, it's never ended. It's still going on. Many people died in Vietnam, but haven't laid down and be buried yet. What I mean by that, they basically lost everything in Vietnam. They lost themselves. They're almost just a shell back now. Where did that come from? Well, post-traumatic stress uh, they received. Uh, coming back 
going through what they did and coming back to their families. There were so many divorces and families broken up during that time. Uh, the effects of the defoliants that were sprayed, the diseases that were out there uh, in, in the jungle environment, uh, even things like uh, uh, almost like um, athlete's foot, but in Vietnam it was jungle rot and uh, those sort of things are still affecting and affecting lives and so forth today. Vietnam vets children and Vietnam vets grandchildren are all being affected by Agent Orange. Not all, but some of them are being affected by Agent Orange that was sprayed on the, on the soldier then. So there's a lot of things out there. But the majority of those who served in Vietnam came home and made great citizens. In fact, 85% of them come home. I think that's... Uh, uh, was higher than any war up to them. They got on their lives, raised their family, and added something to our country for the better. And some are going to tell you they never think about the war. Well, you got to watch those folks because they're going to lie to you about something. Because I tell you what, if they were in Vietnam, I don't care what their job was, whether it was on the, on the line out there uh, fighting in the jungles or back in the base camps or whatever, the war in Vietnam changed their lives. In some way or another, their lives were changed and not necessarily for the good. They're going to lie to you about something else because it's like the old saying, uh, when were you in Vietnam? I was there last night. And we have found now that people who come home, got, came home, got on with their lives, got out there, got a job, and did kind of put Vietnam back in, back in their mind there, even though it was still there, and every now and then it would still pop up. But the challenge was that as they're getting older now, they're retiring. They don't have the activities they had before. So all of a sudden, a lot of those thoughts and memories are coming back to them now in their uh, more seasoned uh, ages and so forth. I want to get a couple of quotes here I thought, I thought were fantastic. Any man or woman who may be asked in, in this century what they did to make life worthwhile in their lifetime can respond with a great deal of pride and satisfaction. I served a career in the United States military. They went out there and did something that so many people didn't want to do, wouldn't do. I especially appreciate the young men and women today who joined. Back in my day, people were joined because the judge gave them a choice, either jail or Vietnam, or the draft, or just went out and joined. A majority of the people who went to Vietnam uh, were uh, men who joined the military. There was uh, much more of them than there were of draftees. And this one I think is also very good. Uh, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We, did, we didn't pass it, into our, pass, it, pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It's not something they inherit. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. In other words, each generation has got to go out there and do their thing for our freedoms in this country. Now, we've talked a little bit about uh, the Vietnam War and how it began and, and, and how it ended and, and so forth. But I want to throw in a couple of extra guys here that uh, I think are worth uh, noting and um, Tomorrow, ask them, ask them your, uh, if you're a Vietnam vet, ask them your friends when the Vietnam War began and when it ended and see what they come up with. And you can kind of refer them back to this show and, and, and they can get confused like the rest of us. But, um, you know, the Medal of Honor is a very, very special thing. I am very fortunate to have met some Medal of Honor uh, awardees. I won't say winners because they didn't win it. Uh, they went through a whole lot of hell to get to it. And unfortunately, um, a good part of the Medal of Honor recipients are uh, received after they were dead. Uh, it was good for their families. But I'm going to talk to you about a, a special uh, Vietnam veteran. Uh, this guy uh, was somewhat of a maverick. You know, people always talk about you aren't really in the military until you get an Article 15. Well, I guess I was in the military because I got one. Uh, my problem was I've always I've been able to uh, tell you what I thought and so forth. So uh, I got an Article 15 speeding <coughs> on uh, Fort Belvoir, taking some Marines to go AWOL to the airport. But uh, I got pulled over. 
Uh, this guy has got more um, medals than all, all, Alvin York or Audie Murphy all put together. And this is his picture. Uh, Johnny, Joe, Ronnie, Hooper. He looks like a guy that could tell you where to stick it. In addition to Medal of Honor, Hooper was also awarded two silver stars, six bronze star with V device, an air medal, the Republic of Vietnam Gallantry Cross with palm, and eight purple hearts. He wasn't much good for dunking, was he? Now, how did he get in the military? Well, he first enlisted in the Navy in 1956. He served and, and he served this period of time and received an honorable discharge in 1959. In 1960, he re-enlisted in the United States Army as a private. He rose to the rank of uh, Staff Sergeant. But being the uh, maverick that it was, he, uh, he got several ARCA 15s. I'm surprised that he got ARCA 15s and, uh, after several of them and not a court-martial, but he got several uh, ARCA 15s. He was brought back from a Staff Sergeant down to a lowly corporal. And eventually worked hard and got his stripes back, and he kept asking to go back to Vietnam, and they just didn't want to let him send him back over there. But finally, he was uh, uh, transferred to the 101st, and the 101st uh, uh, took him over to Vietnam in 1967, and he was a squad leader. Now, I'm going to read you the Medal of Honor citation he had, why he got the Medal of Honor, the bad boy, the hard to get along with, the maverick, the malcontent, but a real soldier. Hooper's unit was assaulting a heavily defended enemy position along a riverbank when it encountered a withering hell of fire from rockets, machine guns, and automatic weapons. Staff Sergeant Hooper rallied his several men and stormed across the river, overrunning several bunkers on the opposite shore. Thus inspired, in other words, they were going, show me, and then we'll come. Thus inspired, the rest of the company moved to the attack. With utter disregard for his own safety, he moved out under the intense fire again and pulled back the wounded. Moving them to safely and doing this act, Hooper was seriously wounded himself, but he refused medical aid and returned to his men. With a relentless enemy fire disrupting the attack, he single-handedly stormed three enemy bunkers, destroyed them with hand grenades and rifle fire shot two enemy soldiers who had attacked and wounded the chaplain. Still leading his men forward in a sweep of the area, Hooper destroyed three building housing enemy fire riflemen. At this point, he was attacked by a North Vietnamese officer with whom he fatally, who, whom he fatally wounded with his bayonet. I guess he ran out of, uh, ran out of ammunition and, and stuck the guy with the bayonet. Find his men under heavy fire from a house to the front, he proceeded alone to the building, killing its occupants with rifle fire and grenades. But now his initial body wound had been compounded by grenades, fragments, yet despite the multiple wounds and loss of blood, he continued to lead his men against the intense enemy fire. As his squad reached the final line of enemy resistance, see, it ain't over because the fat lady hadn't sung yet, it received a devastating fire from four bunkers in line on its left flank. Hooper gathered several hand grenades and raced down a small trench which ran the length of the bunker line, tossing grenades into each bunker as he passed by, killing all but two of the occupants. And you know what they were doing when he passed by. They were probably shooting at him. With, with these positions destroyed, he concentrated on the last bunker facing his men, destroying the first with an incendiary grenade, a Willie Pete, and neutralizing two more by rifle fire. Still, he then raced across an open field, stood on an enemy fire to rescue a wounded man who was trapped in a trench. Upon reaching the man, he was faced by an armed enemy soldier whom he killed with a pistol. Moving his comrade to safely and returning to his men, he neutralized the final pocket of enemy resistance by fatally wounding three North Vietnamese officers with, with rifle fire. Hooper then established a final line and reorganized his men, not accepting medical treatment until this was accomplished and not consenting to evacuation until the following morning. Now, that man may have been a malcontent, but he was a soldier's soldier. I mean, just can you imagine all the things he did? I mean, he didn't have time to think. He just went out there 
and said, I'm the leader, and I'm going to do whatever it took. When he got back from Vietnam, he was wounded so bad uh, that um, uh, they discharged him. He was a little bit bitter, uh, but he had been commissioned before, but before that time he was commissioned, before he came back from Vietnam as a second lieutenant and was discharged again from active duty, and he went into reserves. Now I want to talk to you about another Medal of Honor winner that's a little bit unusual. This guy, never heard of uh, somebody doing this before, gave his Medal of Honor back. Now let me say that again. Here is a guy who went out there and did what he had to do like this other guy, and he gave his medal back. He wouldn't like John Kerry threw somebody else's medals over the fence. This guy said, just keep it. He was the chaplain. Charlie Leitke, I think that's where you pronounce his name, an Army chaplain, the only known recipient of the Medal of Honor to ever return the medal in demonstration of political dissent. Credited with saving the lives of more than 20 wounded men during a fierce battle in South Vietnam, Leitke transformed into a peace activist and ferociously opponent, uh, opponent of the Reagan administration's policy in Central America. He came back uh, as a, he was a chap. He was a preacher. Went into uh, the military. Went two trips to Vietnam. Came back, and was still involved in uh, community work and uh, didn't like what was going on in Central America. In 1985, for, following a 47-day hunger strike near the capital against Americans' involvement in the Central American conflict, likely left his medal at the Vietnam War Memorial on the National Mall. Now, the park uh, rangers go by ever so often and pick up things there, and I can imagine what they had to say when they found a Medal of Honor uh, there at the wall. But, see, not only did he give up his Medal of Honor, but when you get the Medal of Honor, you have a lifetime pension and medical benefits. But he felt so strongly about his beliefs and protesting against the uh, Reagan administration's uh, activities in Central America, he just walked away from all of it. Uh, maybe he was crazy, but uh, he was definitely a man of his convictions. Now, let me read you a little bit about how he got his Medal of Honor, and you can appreciate uh, him saying, I don't believe in what's going on, and I'm going to stand up for, for what's going on. On December 6, 1967, likely was participating in a search and destroy mission near the village of Fulak in South Vietnam when his company came under intense fire from a Viet Cong battalion. According to his Medal of Honor citation, the massive volume of fire forced the soldiers to hug the ground and was likely who was the first to jump up into action. Dashing to the aid of two wounded men who had fallen 15 meters from an enemy machine gun position. In other words, this guy is a chaplain. He don't carry a weapon. Two Americans were killed within, or were shot within 15 meters of the enemy, and he rushed towards the enemy to help these guys. In a magnificent display of courage and leadership, Chaplain Litke began moving upright through the enemy fire, administrating last rites to the dying and evacuating the wounded. Reach like his citation. By the time the savage battle was over, a wounded Litke had personally carried 23 men to the landing zone for evacuation, all while under heavy fire and without carrying a weapon. It was his first time in combat. There were two other chaplains who were awarded the Medal of Honor in the Vietnam War, but they were honored posthumously. Chaplain Lackley came back and served another tour in Vietnam. It was the first tour. His first tour was when he received the Medal of Honor, his first battle. Then he came back and said, let's do it again. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, I guess, but uh, uh, he definitely uh, was a man of conviction. Uh, standing up, uh, people shooting at you, you don't have a weapon to shoot back, and you, it's almost like you can't hit me. That's about faith. Yeah. Uh, faith and, and getting out there. Now, As it says here, the American war in Vietnam was so many, with so many nuances. 
I mean, there's so many things going on, and 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 uh, with us supporting the South Vietnamese, then we started taking over and fighting the war ourselves, and then we tried to back come back and track the South Vietnamese. And as the war was binding down, the South Vietnamese were becoming uh, so all, quite often becoming hostile to the Americans because the Americans were leaving, and these people had been in war almost all their life, and all of a sudden the Americans were going home. Uh, you had a lot of corruption in the South Vietnamese government. You had corruption in the American uh, forces line. You had people who were uh, like supply sergeants. Not all of them. There were some good ones out there, but who were some who were running the clubs and so forth who became millionaires. You had all these things going on. So how do you come up with a consensus of anything? You had the war protesters going on. You had soldiers who kept going back over there. As I mentioned early on, it was one of the most, and actually uh, Richard Nixon made this statement, uh, is the most misunderstood, misrecorded, and, and full of myths and half-truths of any war in the United States that I've been part of. Going back to our last show, the misstatements, the mistruths, the myths about the three young Marines that had deserted, the three young Marines that they left on the island and never went back and got. As you're going through and you're studying, whether it's Vietnam or anything else, please don't go back and take any one source. As I showed you a while ago, uh, Davis Station, the gentleman there, uh, uh, Davis was listed as the first man to die in Vietnam. That's because uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson made a misstatement and now it went out. It's like the story of who was the longest held POW. If you were asked most Vietnam veterans and people who studied the Vietnam War, they're going to tell you wrong. The longest held Vietnam POW was a guy by the name of Hugh Thompson. Uh, I'm, I had a senior moment here. I lost, I lost a guy that was six months later from him, uh, who everybody else thinks it was. Uh, but uh, Hugh Thompson was the longest. So when you go out there and study, don't take a single source I mean, I know it's going to be hard for y'all to understand, but the Internet lies and everything on Facebook ain't the truth. I know it's going to be a shock for some of you no. who get all your information and, and on politics and what's going on in the country through uh, that out there. But go out there and do your own research. Uh, go out there and check it out. Talk to people. Uh, whenever possible, talk to somebody who's there. Uh, but even people there see things a different way. It's amazing. You know, they talk about uh, uh, eyewitnesses. Uh, some guys said, some of them say they had the guy had on a brown jacket. The next guy says he didn't have a jacket to own. One guy says he was six foot tall. The other guy says he was five foot two. Uh, so even uh, live sightings and so forth or eyewitnesses are not always true. But go out there and check as, as you study and on anything. Now, our next show is scheduled for February 22nd. I have uh, put out requests to two different uh, guests. I haven't heard back from them yet. Hopefully I'll get one of them, uh, and then I'll have the other one lined up for that. Uh, one of them was at the one of the final battles uh, of the war, uh, Cantum, the Battle of Cantum, just before Saigon fell. And one was uh, on the last plane to leave Vietnam. In fact, his picture was taken. He didn't even know it until several years later he went back on a, a mission for uh, with with he became an attorney and went back with a law uh, with a law group, and his wife saw a picture in the in Hanoi in one of the museums there and says, "That's you, Jim," and that uh, Richard, excuse me, his name is Richard Penner, and she said, "That's you, Rich," and he looked at the picture and says, "Yeah, that's my briefcase." So I got them and I've got some more people lining up that uh, so you don't have to listen to me each time. But, uh, again, uh, please reach out there and, and give me some feedback on, on what you'd like to see. I want to cover uh, uh, John Paul Van, who was a very special uh, man, uh, American uh, citizen during the Vietnam War. Uh, he was uh, essentially all the way through the war. I wanted to uh, do a report on him. I'm hoping one of the guys that uh, uh, my guest, who was also knew him, uh, can give us some insight. Also, I want to do uh, uh, a story about the women uh, who are, were lost in Vietnam. Uh, there was one nurse killed uh, by hostile fire. 
Uh, there were some other nurses at the end of the war. Uh, one of the things I want to do is Operation Baby Lift. Uh, as they were, as the war was winding down, the Amerasian children, Amerasian children, which were the children of the American soldier and the Vietnamese uh, women, uh, were not looked looked upon favorably. They were looked upon more favorably than the French uh, children who were left behind. So there was a plain load of Amerasian children uh, who took off from Saigon and shortly after uh, Tonson Air Base, shortly after it took off, it exploded, uh, killing everybody aboard, basically, and the nurses and so forth. And why it exploded, uh, they felt like when the babies were put on, somebody put on a bomb or something with it. So. Uh, that's another show I'm working on. Uh, another one I'm working on is How We Lost the Vietnam War. That one is uh, kind of politically uh, fringe there. I don't necessarily go along with what it says, but I think it's uh, information that would be uh, needed out there as you study the Vietnam War. Again, thank you for tuning in. Looking forward to seeing you next time, and have a good evening. You're tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.